Welcome to Dwellings, a podcast from the City of San Jose Housing Department, where we talk with thought leaders about ending homelessness, building affordable housing, and key housing policies. I'm Jeff Scott, and I'll be your host for season three of Dwellings. On today's episode, I'm joined by Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director of the City of San Jose Housing Department. We're going to talk about how financing affordable housing in San Jose actually works. We are joined today by Rachel Vanderveen. She's a deputy director in the city of San Jose Housing Department. And Rachel has graciously agreed to talk to us today about affordable housing finance. Welcome, Rachel. Hello. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, thanks for joining us. And Rachel, can you start off by... um, letting our audience know what your role is. What, what do you do for the city's housing department? Sure. So I serve as the deputy director for the housing department and I manage multiple groups within the department. And my primary responsibilities are to manage the residential development division and the rent stabilization program and our administration team. And so through that, the most significant responsibilities are to manage our new production program for affordable housing, and then also to oversee our rent control um, requirements for the city. And so those are my two primary responsibilities. There's always a lot of talk in the media around Silicon Valley about affordable housing, the, the need for more. It seems like there's a constant need for more. What are some of the financing tools at your disposal to help make it possible for us to build more new affordable housing? So the tools that developers use most frequently to build affordable housing are the low-income housing tax credit. And so the tax credit is a federal program that allows developers to bring in investors from outside who receive tax credits for in exchange for their investment in the affordable housing development. Secondly, there are multifamily revenue bonds that are paired with tax credits that are distributed through the state of California. And so those two tools, uh, tax credits can actually be used alone or with bonds, but those are the most critical tools and heavily used in putting together the financing necessary to make affordable housing happen. What do you mean when you say that the bonds can be paired with tax credits? Can you explain that a little bit more? Right. So the state has a program where they allocate bonds that can be used for a specific development. When those bonds are allocated, the same project also can receive 4% tax credits. So the two come together as a pair and provide two different types of financing that work really well to make an affordable housing development work. So what's a 4% tax credit? What does that mean in plain English? What that means is the investor, they can actually purchase tax credits themselves and they can use those to offset their tax obligation as a company or a bank Um, whatever the industry may be. And the 4% tax credit, the 4% refers to the value and there's 4% and 9%. And so with 9% tax credits, you can actually receive even more value from the tax credits versus the the 4%. When these tax credits are paired with bonds, who issues the bonds and who is responsible for paying them back? The local jurisdiction is the most common issuer. So in this case, in our case, the city of San Jose actually issues the bonds. There are also some additional outside issuers is kind of what we call them, but there's different agencies that do have the authority to issue bonds as well. But in the case of the city of San Jose, we typically are going to be the issuer of the bonds. When the bonds are issued, then that provides funding that goes to the developer and provides the funds necessary to, for example, for construction costs for the development itself. How or by whom are those bonds paid back? So the bonds are paid back in a couple of different ways. If they are used for construction, many times they're actually, some portion of them may be paid back when the project is refinanced 
at permanent financing, which means after the building is built and tenants move in, then the financing is actually restructured into permanent financing. So sometimes some of the bonds are paid off as soon as the permanent loan is put in place. But other times uh, the schedule is put together where the bonds are in place for many years. And those are paid by the developer over time as just regular payments on the, on the development. So here's a question. I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, why is it so complicated? You're talking about tax credits and pulling in investors through those tax credits and having bond issuances and then having to pay back those bonds. Whereas I think a lot of us are just used to borrowing some money to buy a house or borrowing money to build a house. What is it about the nature of affordable housing that causes it to become a little bit more complicated to line up the financing? Well, that is a good question. Typically for real estate, there's two types of investment that are made. And this is not affordable housing. This is just general real estate. So typically there's debt and equity. And so a, you know, if a developer wants to build a building, they're going to be looking for debt from a bank, just like you know, if I wanted to go buy a house, I would go to a bank and get a loan. And so um, the debt works very similarly, but the equity is, is a little bit different where it's a little bit um, higher risk and you may have um, an investor who really wants to make a higher return in a shorter period of time on their equity investment. So that is how a typical real estate transaction is put together. In the case of affordable housing, instead of having debt and equity, there's still debt. There are first mortgages that developers receive on these buildings that they get from banks that we're all very familiar with. Bank of America and Wells Fargo, Bank of the West, it's just our general banks that we're very familiar with. But the equity is something that is not necessarily going to happen um, for an affordable housing development because in the in the long term, the rents are limited. And so there's not going to be as much incentive or payoff for someone to put equity into the, into the real estate deal. So instead, that's where the bonds and the tax credits come in and really serve as that piece of the financing. So I guess it's a long way of saying it is, it's similar to how real estate is developed in, for both market and affordable. But for affordable, it's very difficult to have an equity investor come in without these tools of tax credits and bonds. In the city of San Jose, there are also um, other ways that the city itself raises money that will then be spent or invested on affordable housing. I'm thinking of Measure E, which the voters passed a couple of years ago. I believe there's a commercial linkage fee that's assessed to commercial developments. I think there may be some sort of a inclusionary housing fee that market rate developers pay. Um, and all these different sources of funding go into, at least partially, go into helping to um, pay for new affordable housing. Right? So can you let us know, or can you explain to us, aside from the tax credits and bonds, how do, how do these other fees, how do these other sources of funding kind of complement the bonds and the, uh, and the tax credits you just explained? So in affordable housing financing, what we refer to as this remaining piece is gap financing. So what you do is you take a look at the total cost of development for the affordable housing development. You look at the first lender, you look at that debt, and then you um, consider how much money you can raise through tax credits and bonds. And then typically there's a gap a gap between the total cost and, and that stack of financing. We call that the gap that needs to be filled by a local agency. So the city of San Jose will take a look at that gap and will provide a loan with very favorable terms to the affordable housing developer to make it happen. And we're gonna use all those different sources that you just mentioned. If it be measure E funds or commercial linkage fees, uh, money raised through our inclusionary program. Those are all different funds that we will use to provide a loan to the developer for the gap that remains. You just said that the, the loan that the city would make in that 
case to try to cover that gap um, is tends to be pretty favorable to the developer. Can you explain what that means? Because I think a lot of us are familiar with typical residential mortgage. We get a mortgage, we pay it back over time, 30 years or some other period of time um, in roughly equal installments each month. So how do these um, loans that you're describing differ from a traditional mortgage? Yeah, so these loans are called residual receipt loans. So what that means is instead of paying uh, a regular payment every month, what the developer can do is take a look at the operating costs versus the rents that were collected for any given year and determine how much money was is remaining after paying all of the debt and other obligations on the property. What happens then is there's a calculation made on the remaining amount. And if there is a remaining amount, it's split between the developer and the city, and that piece pays back the city's loan. So what that means is that there is no actual specific payment that's due. And instead, the cost of the development is calculated. And let's say that there's a year that for some reason rents were low, then that year they do not have to make a large payment to the city. If there's nothing left over, then their payment to the city could actually be zero, and that would be acceptable. But at some point, the loan would be paid off, correct? Perhaps if the property is refinanced or if they reach the end of their financing, then at some point, one would assume that loan will ultimately be paid back in some form. Is that correct? Yes. So that loan will be paid back by the end of the term. And many times for these, developments, after 15 years, there's an opportunity for a refinancing. As I mentioned earlier, many of the deals include tax credits and tax credits are invested on a 15 year basis. And so what happens is after all the obligations and all the needs are met for the tax credit investor, after 15 years, it's very common that they actually exit the deal and find another, another opportunity to invest. And so after 15 years, there is a good opportunity to refinance the whole project. And so that provides a great opportunity for pay downs for the city or even just restructuring so that the city's portion can be paid off more quickly. And I understand that when a developer refinances an affordable housing project, it's common that part of the conditions of that refinance are the extension of the period of affordability so that in exchange for refinancing, they have to agree to keep the rents at an affordable level for a certain number of additional years. Is that correct? Yes. In exchange for the loan that the city makes to the developer, there's an affordability restriction that's placed on the property. And that restriction is initially put in place for 55 years. And for 55 years, the apartments in that building, the rents are determined by the original structure of the, of the deal. So rents must be limited to specific income levels. And so when there's an opportunity to refinance, it's very common for the city to request additional time for that restriction. So if it started out 55 years, it is very likely that we could ask for an additional 15 years when they refinance. And so um, I just want to go back to something you just mentioned just a moment ago about the, uh, the rents being restricted and, and what exactly that means, because that obviously plays into um, how much income the developer is going to derive and how much how much they're able to pay back the city over time. So um, can you give us some examples of what the income thresholds might be at you know, different levels of affordability for um, what we are generally calling affordable housing? The way affordable housing works, as I mentioned, is that the rents in the development are limited by income. And so, for example, if you think about a four-person household in San Jose right now, rents 
for a low income unit would be limited to a household who earns $84,000 a year. Now we also have extremely low income households, which is a priority for our department. And for a household of four, that would be a family who makes $50,000 a year. And if it's just one person, it could actually be someone who's making around $35,000 a year. So there is a range in income levels in many of our developments, but it is a stated city council priority that 40% of all of our funding provide units that are affordable to our extremely low income families. Okay. So, and as a way I understand it, um, you just touched on a couple of the levels. I believe there's extremely low, which is the, the lowest income level. Then there's very low income and there's low income. And I think then there's moderate income. And so each one of these income levels, if I understand it correctly, um, has a slightly higher threshold, like extremely low would be the, the lowest income very low, we would allow for a slightly higher income. Low income, again, could have a slightly higher income again. And then moderate income can would have the highest income, if that's how, if, if I have that correct. And so my question for you is, um, when a developer, an affordable housing developer is putting together a deal and trying to pencil it out and make sure it works, will they often have a, a, a mix of different um, income levels in their units. So maybe a handful of low income units and a handful of very low income units, maybe a, a few moderate income units to try to make the deal work financially? Yes, it's very common to have a mix within the development. So a typical mix is actually a third, a third, a third. That's how I like to think about it. So a third are gonna be affordable to our extremely low income households, a third to our very low income and a third to our low income. It's actually very uncommon for our developments to fund at the moderate income level for rental housing. Typically we would do moderate income for for sale or other programs, uh, but we don't have very many moderate income households that are receiving funding in these apartment buildings. And what about a um, what about a market rate developer, a traditional housing developer who's building market rate apartments to rent out? Will they oftentimes include some low income apartments that have um, restrictions on their rent? Um, is that an obligation they have? You know, why would they do that if they do that at all? So the city has an inclusionary housing requirement. And that requirement states that market rate developers are required to provide some form of affordable housing. So developers have many choices. They can do that by actually building affordable units into their development or they can also provide land and dedicate land so that affordable housing development can be built somewhere else. Or they can partner with an affordable housing developer and have the affordable units built um, adjacent to the market rate units. So there's actually several different options. And what we do is work with the market rate developer to make sure as they are building market rate housing, affordable housing is also being built at the same time. So for developers who don't want to develop affordable housing or they feel like their project won't pencil out if they put in affordable housing, is there a fee that they can pay to the city in lieu of building the actual units themselves? Yes, the ordinance also allows developers to calculate a fee based on the number of square feet of market rate development that they're building and they can choose an option of paying a fee, then those fees are taken by our team and we invest them into a affordable housing development that's coming up in our pipeline. So that is an option. And do we ever have situations where we have affordable housing developers who are doing more than just housing? So I'm thinking 
you know, one thing that I see a lot of is I see apartments going in around retail or restaurant space. So there's some sort of a mixed use of the um, real estate development. Does, does that also hold true for affordable housing development that sometimes it's part of a mixed use development? It can be. Um, there's a recent example of an affordable housing development that was just completed called Ketzel Gardens. And on the bottom floor of Ketzel Gardens, there are, um, there's a great open space for Somos, which is Somos Maker, which is a nonprofit. There's also a credit union there and an incubator for small businesses. And so all of those are actually in the same building as the affordable housing units. So that's one example. Um, we have had other commercial spaces built in the same building again with affordable housing, such as a childcare center or um, even a 7-Eleven or you know, other small retail spaces. So that um, is something that can happen. Our team really gets excited when we get when we see partnerships between nonprofits and affordable housing developers because we think it's a wonderful idea to have nonprofits have space that they know they can count on into the future, but also can run programs that provide great support to the people living in the affordable housing development and in the neighborhood. And as far as the, the companies or the organizations that actually um, put these deals together, the developers, it's, it sounds like it's typically nonprofits that will get into the affordable housing development. Are, are there any market rate developers, um, for-profit companies that also build affordable housing, or is it really a specialty that is reserved for nonprofit developers? We have both nonprofit and for-profit developers who specialize in affordable housing. And so it really can be either or. It's not limited to nonprofit developers. Um, I would just say that for-profit developers have to make a choice and decide if this is how they want to, um, like that they want to develop an expertise and work in this space. Um, either way, we've had great successes with affordable housing develop development being built. And um, we really value partners with both for-profit and nonprofit developers. And I know the city of San Jose, really our entire region, Silicon Valley, it's just so expensive. We're all very well aware of you know, how expensive it is. Um, land acquisition, materials, labor, it's all much more expensive here in our area than it is in much of the, the United States. Does that make it, does that make the process of affordable housing and finance more complicated, more difficult? Or if I went to some other city in some other part of the country, would it be pretty similar to what we're seeing? The pro would the process be pretty similar to what we're seeing here? The high cost of development in San Jose and actually in the Bay Area region has become a challenge. As I stated earlier, there's layers of financing, right? So we have the first lender, and then we have the bonds, the tax credits, and then the gaps, gap financing. And many times what happens with the high cost is that it makes gaps really large. It makes them large, large enough where it may be difficult for the city or the county to come in and provide that level of funding. It also um, has proven to be less competitive for state resources such as the, the bonds. And so what's happened is because the costs are higher here, there's less of an interest to, or the, those projects are just less competitive. So it has become a problem. We're trying to work through it on a policy point, but also by trying to think about innovative ways to bring down cost, because we really need to be thinking about how to lower those numbers. Um, and not just continue to watch them climb year over year because it really is becoming a barrier to the affordable housing development itself is to just allow the cost to just continue to climb. So we're looking at innovative technologies such as 
modular construction or mass timber construction. There's different methods out that are available to affordable housing developers that we want to explore and just understand if there's a way to start to bring those costs back down. It sounds like getting more affordable housing built in this area is not an easy task. And I know that your department is always facing a lot of pressure to get more housing built. So I don't envy the position that you're in, but I certainly respect all the work that you and your team is doing. Do you have anything else that you wanted to add about affordable housing finance? Sometimes when I think about affordable housing finance, I feel like it's layers in a cake. So you have many different layers that all have to come together at the right time. One of our layers is our lending ourselves, um, but that can't do it alone. We need to understand what it takes to make sure the private lenders are willing to invest in affordable housing. We need to make sure we have tax credit investors and that our bonds can be we can access them and get the and secure allocations through the state, through different policy decisions that are made there. And then of course, our funding needs to come in as well. So it's just important for us to understand how it all comes together so that in the end, it will be complete. Well, thank you, Rachel. We appreciate your time. It was a pleasure talking with you and thanks for being so informative about your explanations with regard to affordable housing finance. I know it's a difficult subject. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel, for joining me on today's episode. To learn more about affordable housing financing, please visit our website at sjhousing.org. Thanks for listening to Dwellings, the City of San Jose Housing Department podcast. Our theme music is Speed City, composed and performed by Attain Charles. Thanks to San Jose Jazz for letting us use their music. If you like the show, please subscribe and share with your friends and family. If you're looking for more ways to help address housing and homelessness issues in San Jose, please check out the show notes. You can follow the housing department on social media or on Twitter and Facebook, SJ City Housing. And if you have questions or comments about today's episode, please send them to housingcoms at sanjoseca.gov. The artwork on our website was created by Chelsea Palacio. Dwellings is produced by me, Jeff Scott, and Jose Chavez of the housing department.